I grew up in Roma, right in the middle of where lots of Queensland's coal seam gas is found. Friends of mine still live there. So I wasn't surprised that my name came up when Australia Pacific LNG wanted help explaining how they're developing natural gas from Queensland's coal seams. I agreed, but on one condition. We head back to where it's all happening so I could find out what's going on for myself. I spent time learning about CSG water, about aquifers and aquitards, and about what happens to the water when it comes to the surface. Follow my journey and find out for yourself. I guess that was one of the things that I was, you know, when I was coming out to learn more about it, you know, there was the environment question, you know, how it affected the environment, and what CSG is doing to the water supplies. I'm a hydrogeologist, which is how water moves and how it's stored in rocks, um, what the chemistry of the water is and how man impacts on that groundwater resource. This whole sequence is called the Great Artesian Basin or the GAB. Um, and it's a series of what we call aquifers and aquitards. So an aquifer is simply a rock where the grains are big enough that you can move water in between them. You can see there's big holes between the grains. And aquitards, on the other hand, are very, very fine. They're so fine that water can't move very easily at all between those. Okay, so the landowners are getting their water from here? Yeah, that's right, more than 95% of them. You know, the gas companies are getting their water from here. So does that mean there's a risk of contaminating the landowner's water? No, because when we're operating, when we operate the gas wells, there's never actually a time when you have a potential to push anything out of the coal seams and back up into the aquifers. An aquifer basically is a, is a zone that maybe a farmer or a, you know, the local community uses. So we have to case those off so that there's no contamination. The reason you run casing is to give a secure flow path for the water and the gas to come to the surface and that casing plus the cement isolates it from the zones that we're producing from. So this sort of layer acts as a bit of a barrier, doesn't it? Yeah, in, in petroleum terms they, they call them seals. It's the kind of rock that you make a pool table out of or make a building or a bridge out of. So you're not going to move very much water at all through a great big thick layer of, of low permeability siltstone like that. People talk about the water being contaminated and once you talk to the experts, they make sure the water is not the water the farmers use. When you hear Sally explain it to you, you actually start to feel a lot more confident about it all. So we treat the water so we can get a higher beneficial use from it. Yeah. So we're looking at irrigation, we can discharge it into water courses. So here is the feed pond. Its purpose is mainly to reduce the temperature. It comes out of the well quite quite high in temperature, about 40 to 60 degrees Celsius. So how long does this water sit here before it's recycled again back up to the plant? It's a minimum of two days, yeah. but up to 10 days. Yeah. So that gives it enough time. Decrease its temperature, yeah. drop out the large solids, yeah. and then feed in through the plant. The water's actually got elevated levels of salts. Um, so they're high enough salts that it wouldn't be appropriate for drinking water and reuse. Yeah. So you could actually feed it to cows. So, so cattle, so, sheep, yeah. Yep, here at Tlinga, cattle and sheep are fine to drink this water and it won't do them any kind of harm. So we do sort of filtering systems, getting finer and finer in resolution. We're talking about so fine they're smaller than a hair. Uh, after that, we take it through an iron exponge, which talks about sort of the hardness of the water. Hardness of water, if you think about shampooing your hair, oh, yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember you, you may, may remember yeah, yeah, the days yeah, when you were yeah, shampooing yeah, your hair yeah. and, and some waters, or ball water for example, you don't usually get a lather with your no. shampooing. Next process is reverse osmosis. It pushes the salts out. So the main point is looking at reducing the salinity of the water. Uh, what, what happens to the salt? So the salt at the moment, we store it in brine ponds, which are lined with similar kind of black plastics. It's actually a thicker black plastic. We're looking at about $100 million worth of investigations in reusing salts. So you can't just put it in a residential pool? And salt. You can actually, you it's can. the same salt. Yeah, it's the same exactly. Salt. The real trick for us is to create industries that can use the water. So how do we get water to be used by landowners? How do we use water in productive and useful ways rather than letting it be something that's kind of an excess to the project. So that's a real focus area for us is actually coming up with good ways to use the water wisely. The experts that we, we spoke to on this journey and uh, you know they're the best in their field and they're looking to improve continually you know they're looking for, for better answers. 
Obviously, there's, there's a bit of work still to be done, but you can see that you know, it's all about protecting the landowners and the water.